ladies and gentlemen, my name is Natalie Marie Hart. You are watching the Natalie Marie Hart Show. My website is www.crystalkidsradio.com. You can check out other archives, and you can also donate on my website to help support independent broadcasters. All donations are greatly appreciated. Thank you for subscribing to my YouTube channel, which is Natalie Marie Hart, and thank you for liking my page, Natalie Marie Hart, for those that have. Today, my special guest is Ruth. McDonald. She has been featured on the National Geographic channel, The Truth Behind King Arthur, and she had the honor to work with Graham Phillips, the author of The Lost Tomb of King Arthur. In Ruth's case, she is looking through myth, mystery, and beauty that makes up our past for the archaeological proof. Now, I would like to introduce her to the show. Hello, Ruth. How are you doing today? It is an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. It's great to be on, and how are you today? I'm doing fine, thank you. It's an honor. So where are you from, for those that may not know you? Um, I'm from Liverpool, which is a little place on the northwest of England. We're probably more famous for things like the Beatles than anything else. Oh, that is wonderful. I love the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Could you please be so kind to tell the audience about yourself? Yes, well, I grew up on a yacht. Um, before I was 18, I'd sailed twice around the world. And while I was traveling, I was really lucky. I got to visit some of the really ancient cultures. Mm -hmm. So the, the people who live on the remotest islands in the world, out in the middle of the Pacific, Aborigines in Australia, uh, Zulus in South Africa. And they all have myths and legends behind their cultures. And it got me really interested. So I'm a forensic archaeologist which technically means, so if you decide to kill someone and go and bury them, I'm the sort of person that gets called in to dig them up. <laughs> and what inspired you to become an archaeologist? Um, a lot of things. I was lucky enough that my dad and, well, I was lucky enough that my mum and dad are both archaeologists. Mm -hmm. um, they both specialise in marine archaeology, so shipwrecks and things like that. So I grew up lucky enough to go from site to site, and when I was younger, we were working on a lot of shipwrecks. So that inspired me to look into the field. Um, I qualified, first of all, just as an ordinary archaeologist. But then I got interested in the idea of there's a science behind archaeology. So we say things, but why do we believe them? Why do we say that when the Neolithic came along, farmers started to say, well, we have property. Why did they start putting up things like Stonehenge? So that's where I sort of went through there. And then I started working on programs with people like Graham. And I was on looking at things. So we were looking for actually where he was buried. So my job was to try and find the science and use that to actually try and find a tomb of King Arthur. We weren't lucky enough to find him on that program. But, you know, in Graham, we'll be back looking again soon enough. Yes, and I'm excited to talk about this topic. So how, how, what is your opinions on the topic, his book, the King Arthur topic? And what exactly was your job? So, so I'll do the job first of all. Um, where Graham found, where Graham thinks uh, King Arthur might have actually his final resting place might be is a little lake right in the middle of England. Now, it's a fascinating little lake. There's, um, there's been a hill fort, so a place where people would go to, we think, possibly worship or maybe just have a meeting place, a bit like the pub nowadays. And it's been in use for thousands and thousands of years. So my job was to see, could we find anything underwater? Now, on land, when you do archaeology on land, you get to walk to a spot and you get to dig. Mm -hmm. Underwater, imagine trying to do that same dig through a thousand years of history, whilst breathing your air through a tiny little tube and not able to see a thing. So that's, I like to make things difficult for myself, basically. You do, yes. But it must <laughs> be fun, your job. It is. And you get to look at, at projects. So with King Arthur, we tend to sort of say he's this romanticized medieval knight. Mm -hmm, definitely. But, but it could be that he was he's made up of several people. So until the Romans came along in England, we didn't have writing. We told everything through oral traditions. And just in the way that I suppose when you were little, your mum might used to tell you that there was dangers in certain places. You know, you couldn't go into the forest because there was a monster that might eat you. In the same way as before writing, people would tell stories like that. And the great heroes 
you'd have the great heroes and the great battles that come down. And it might have been several people were Arthur. We just don't know. But there's too much evidence out there for there to have not have been some great king or warlord at the time. Wow. And the story of King Arthur has amazed everyone. The whole world always wants to know. And Graham's book has been one of the... It's amazing the way he wrote it and how you came into the picture and went for to search for this. It's incredible. Like, to find... Amazing. It's just amazing. You're discovering something, and that's what it is. It's an adventure, and it's incredible. <laughs> and I just want to ask you, I heard that you are writing a, your PhD. Uh, can you please tell us more about this and where you're studying? So I'm studying at Liverpool University, which is all lovely. Um, what I'm looking for is Roman ports. Okay. So it sounds like a bit of an odd one, but we're an island in Britain. Romans had to get here somehow. They did it by ships. Um, so I have on this occasion joked maybe they were firing people on catapults across the channel. However, I think ships are probably more likely. <laughs> um, the thing with the ships is they had to dock somewhere. Now, if we can find the ports, we can find the main settlements, and maybe we can find a shipwreck. Now, I want you to imagine you walk out the door today and you drop your watch. Okay, you drop it on the floor and you think, oh, I'll go back and get that. Or you move house, you don't decide to move house and leave all your furniture behind. Exactly. The only time you leave everything behind, pretty much, is a big natural disaster. So I'm thinking Pompeii here, where everything was sealed beneath the layer of ash. Or if your boat's sinking. If a ship sinks, it's an enclosed little time capsule of everything on there. So not just the things that are buried in graves, like swords and shields and all the legendary stuff. But the day-to-day -day stuff, spoons and knives and how they did lights and all the ordinary things that make up day-to-day -day life. Incredible. And we'll get more into that as the interview progresses, but I want to ask you one more question. It's about, I heard that you were a science, science teacher. How do you enjoy that? I love the aspect of science in that we are looking for answers. Mm -hmm. And the, the answer I have today may not be the answer that I have tomorrow. I see. So today, I might believe that um, King Arthur was probably Owen Thangwen from um, a near little Roman place called Roxeter, which is Graham's theory. If tomorrow some more evidence comes along, that can be merged into this theory. Exactly. And we can use that to get a different answer. So, so, what, yep. mm -hmm. so that's what it is for me. It's about combining this the science, my love of looking for myths and things like that, but also looking for pure evidence that if, okay, sometimes in archaeology it wouldn't step up in a course of law, mm -hmm. but at least it's the best answer we can get. Exactly, because again, we're, we're only able to speculate, right? And that's one of the most important things when it comes to archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And when you were with Graham, right, and you were searching uh, what type of tools do you use to locate artifacts under the water? So have you ever watched an old sort of World War II film where they've been in a submarine and you can hear that ping? Yes, I've seen it. And it gets quicker and quicker and quicker as the other submarine comes closer. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's just sonar. And all sonar does is it sends a noise out and it pings back. The same way as a bat uses echolocation. Well, imagine if you could get a thousand of those, seven thousand, ten thousand of those pings and get the computer to change that instead of noise into color. Okay, and that's the first thing we use. So the computer says, well, that ping came back quickest. I'll make that one really bright. That ping didn't come up back at all. I'll leave that black. That one took ages. I'll make it much darker. So you get a picture of the bottom, but it's actually sound that you're seeing, if you like, on the screen. So it can go through the mud. It can go through the layers and we can actually see things. Now, to tell you a little funny story, on that particular job with Graham, we're out scanning and we see under the water going along and gradually it's, it's appearing on the screen and it's, it's a boat, it's a barge. And there's this whole sense of, oh, 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 we could have survived. Maybe something might have survived. Maybe. So we go back to shore and we're all happy with this. And I go up and I show this to Graham and a few others who were there. There's this picture of this barge. Isn't it amazing? Well, the guy who owns the lake, he's a, he's a lovely bloke, but he's quite uh, practical and down to air. He looked at it and he went, yeah, 
we sunk that about 20 years ago. <laughs> it was just one of those complete disappointments at that time. But we had been able to see the entire barge under the water. So that's the first one we use. And then the second one we use is effectively a very sensitive metal detector. Now, on that particular lake we were scanning, there's an old legend that at one point the devil came down and they were making bells and the bells were being taken off to the churches of Bassa, which is the local villages. And the devil dragged the bells back into the water and they cracked and were never used again. Now, when we were surveying, we did find at the exact location this legend says a big metal object. Now, what my job as a scientist, and it's one of those interesting things to look at legends, is to say, well, I highly doubt that the devil rose out of a lake in Shropshire, grabbed two bells and dragged them into the water. But what might that legend be telling us? Well, in fact, cast iron bells, which were being made at the time this legend says, quite frequently cracked when they were being quenched. So they'd need large amounts of water. So it could have been with the amount of churches in the area, they were making bells on the banks of this little lake mm. and then quenching them with the water. And something went wrong. And you can almost see that rather than it just, it's, it's not a very interesting story down at the pub. Oh yeah, I was making the bells and I messed it up a bit and it cracked. Oops. Isn't as interesting as the devil came out and dragged <laughs> it in. So we can actually see practical uses in these these myths and legends that are coming up. And have you ever been able to locate any artifacts? If not, what do you hope to uncover? We've been lucky enough to find literally hundreds. Um, the title forensics in front of my, uh, my working job, if you like, <laughs> generally tends to be the artifacts are often bodies for me. Now, a body can tell you so much. It can tell you what the person's life were like, were they sick, the obvious ones, male, female, age, anything like that. But they can also tell you so much about their actual life. So I've been on wrecks where we've been pulling up people who've got the very remnants of clothes that were incredibly expensive. And yet when you look at their knees and their teeth and their bones, you can see they grew up in real poverty. Yes. So it's these people, Did they? how did they strike it rich? In that particular case I'm thinking of, it was because they went out to Australia made their fortunes and then on the way home sadly the wreck was the ship was lost with most of the people aboard died um, and what when you get find these artifacts these special artifacts how what care do they need when they're uncovered well when we're looking underwater a lot of the things we look at have been attacked by the salt water for hundreds of years mm -hmm. so you can't just bring them up and then put them on the side so one project we've been involved in at the edge is one of the very early submarines. Um, my dad as an archaeologist was looking for it for decades, but he wasn't the one who found it in the end. But the wreck's actually not far from here, one of the earliest submarines in the world. She's called the Resurgum. Now the problem with her is she's a large metal object, and as you know, metal objects in contact with seawater rust. Now under the waves, she's actually safer than if we bring her to the surface. So what they'll have to do when she comes to the surface, she'll have to be kept in fresh water for maybe 10 years, 20 years even, and special chemicals used to actually get the salt off her. Now, have you ever heard of the Mary Rose? Can you please tell us about that? The Mary Rose was a ship that was in, uncovered in 1982, and she was actually raised completely. Now, you think of wood, it's originally from the trees, and sorry to sound like a science teacher here, if you remember, trees have cells. Yes, of course. Yes. The thing with cells on trees and wood is the insides rot, and you're left with a very, very fragile outside. You ever been in the woods and you found a really old piece of tree and it breaks easily in your hands and goes to powder? Right. Well, the entire ship is like that. Yes. So if you just bring them up and let them dry out, that salt grows and it cracks open the wood absolutely destroying the ship. So she was raised in 1982, or let's say started to raise her in 1982. And since then, they've actually been having to wash her down with fresh water. It was only this year that they finally showed the whole ship to the public. So when we find things, it's really important that special conservation measures are put in place to make sure things stay as, they, as we found them. 
And are we, when you're going to these sites, are they usually difficult to access? How are they accessed? It can be a, a real variety of things. Um, sometimes I'm working on top of hilltops, looking at um, burial tombs that were put there 6,000 years ago. Sometimes the archaeology is right in the town centre. Not far from me, there's the first canal of the modern era. So 17, uh, 1730s to 1790s, it was totally opened. Now, that runs right the way through a town. So people go out of a morning and walk their dogs along it. And it's one of the key pieces of archaeology for this country. Totally accessible to everybody. And I've spent quite a bit of time digging up random bits of that and going, ooh, look at that, I'm the first person to stand here for 300 years or whatever it is. Right, definitely. And how do other archaeologists feel about your opinions? The good thing about archaeology is we're, we've all got different opinions, and that, that can make for a great topic, and it can make it great that if two people have got different opinions, we can come together and say, well, I think you, and, you know, we'll agree on it in the end, or agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. Because I have such a reliance on evidence, it tends to be that when I do publish stuff, I can back up my arguments. I'm one of the few archaeologists in this area working on Roman ports. There's plenty working in the Mediterranean where it's all nice and sunny. <laughs> I happen to pick the place where summer is two weeks and the rest of it we get lots and lots of rain. Um, when we're looking at things like Graham's theories, Graham comes across, he's got a lot of evidence behind him, but he doesn't always play well with the academia if you like. Yes, he does. Yes, of course. And he has his own opinions as well. Yes. <laughs> and I just have a question. Uh, I know your parents are into marine archaeology, right? So what is some of the latest marine archaeology discovery for the audience? That they want to talk? So there's lots of things being discovered now. One of the big problems, as I was explaining about conserving it, it it's so expensive to raise a wreck that Sometimes it's better to leave the artifacts where they are, even though the sea might be destroying them. So we have situations where, um, if it's very, very rare, it can be brought to the surface. But a lot of the time, it's better to stay where it is. There was, in the 17th century, uh, a ship called the Mary went ashore um, in Wales. Now, some parts of her have been recovered, but a large part of us actually had to be left where it is. Now, in the UK, we have something called a protected wreck site. It's a, it's a bit boring. It basically means you can't go there. If, if you're caught going there, the police come down and they fine you and they take your boats off you and you're not allowed to have any of your kits and they really do come down heavily on you. So we have about 50 sites in the UK where the wrecks are just completely protected and nobody's allowed to go near them. In the future, as technology improves, we will be able to recover a lot of these sites. That's yeah. Technology is a good thing in this case. It, it can be great. One project that's happening very near me as we speak, on the beach at Formby, um, as the sand washes away, we're actually finding prehistoric footprints. Mm -hmm. And we can see where people thousands and tens of thousands of years ago have walked up the beach, or at the time it would have been the muddy area near the coast. Mm -hmm. And we can see adults from slightly larger feet that we're going to sort of be stereotypical and say are probably men. Slightly smaller feet, following a little bit step behind might have been the women. And then by them, sometimes walking, and you can almost imagine holding hands, very tiny footsteps which show that they're children. So we know that these really early people, before we might even consider ourselves human, were traveling together in these family groups. Now, if you were walking down the beach in Formby first thing in the morning and you see one of these footprints, you can actually take part in the archaeology by just taking a photo of that hmm. and then sending it to someone who's actually researching that. So the technology that's in our back pockets now is helping the bigger projects. It is, I see how it is. And there's another topic that maybe we should talk about. I know the Titanic is one of the most famous shipwrecks in history, but there was another shipwreck that happened on October 26, 1856 called the Royal Charter. Where did the ship set sail from and where did it sink for the audience? I mean, I know of this shipwreck. So the Royal Charter at the time was considered the, well, we now refer to it as the Titanic of their time. Um, 
and it was just devastating what happened. The hurricane that hit and caused her wrecking is actually known as the Royal Charter Hurricane. There's a layer of sandstone that she wrecked herself against, and we refer to it as the Royal Charter Sandstone. If you're into shipwrecks, she's one of the big ones. I was lucky enough to dive on her quite recently, and I was lucky enough when I was growing up that my dad was the main archaeologist on that site. So the Royal Charter has become a bit of a family tradition with one archaeologist after the other being interested in her. But the story is, Australia had only been discovered relatively recently. It was in the 1750s that we start to see Australia appearing on the British sort of horizon, if you like. Convicts are still being shipped out there. And most importantly, gold's being found in large quantities. Now, I want you to sort of put yourself back 150 years. And you're living in sort of the countryside of Wales or the slums of Manchester, where you're uneducated and you've got very, very little prospects. You might be forever destined to go down the mine and you might be in the mill houses. You might be risking life and limb every day. And you and your family save up enough money for one person to go out to Australia to make their fortune. And people were. There was a group of Cornish tin miners who went out, opened their own gold mine. And one of the guys literally, while they were in the mine one day, looked up and managed to pull an 80 kilogram nugget of gold out of the ceiling. It was like an average person's weight in gold. <sighs> so they were set for life. And we get letters at the time from these people saying, I'm coming home and we can get so-and-so out of debtor's prison. And... We won't have to worry about food. We can feed the whole family. We'll be safe. So the Royal Charter left, um, ironically, a place called Anglesey or near Anglesey. She was from Melbourne. Um, sorry, I apologize. She left from Melbourne. And she sailed round. And she was the fastest ship of her time. Huh? Only it took three, three and a half months. And can you imagine three and a half months on a ship? You're probably in steerage, and that literally meant you were where the steering gear was. So the constant noise and during the day having to move so the crew could actually use the ship. The Royal Charter mm -hmm. managed to do it in 59 days. Wow. So, yeah, just totally cutting out a, a huge part of the journey. And she was luxury. Even her third class, which on any other ship would be like, you know, smelly and horrible, was really luxurious. The richest of the rich were on the uh, were on the Royal Charter, in a similar way to the really rich people were on the Titanic when she sailed. Now, there was, the people coming back were so rich that they were actually not bringing aboard just clothes and things like that. They were bringing along bags of gold to take home with them. And we get lots of mentions when she's being loaded that they're having to open the strong room and they're not sure whether they can get all the gold into the strong room. And she was also bringing back the first coins to ever be minted outside the UK. Australian gold made into British coins. She was quite literally a golden ship. She was packed full. And all these people, they were coming home. It was there. They were going to finally see their families. Some of them had been out in Australia for 10, 20 years. They'd had kids who'd grown up and had families of their own while they'd been gone. So she leaves Australia and she makes really good progress. Definitely. 26th of October, as you said, she's coming up and a storm starts to blow in. But there wasn't any major concerns. It didn't look too bad. And the captain went quite close to port to see another famous ship. So his, his, his uh, crew and his passengers could see this famous ship. He put 22 people off in Ireland. And they actually left their families on board because it was safer for their families to remain on Royal Charter than for them to come aboard in, ashore in Ireland and then try and catch another ship back. So as she's sailing up the Irish Sea, she pulls in close to the coast of Wales to see this famous ship and the storm starts to blow up. Now, the problem with Liverpool is you've got to know how to get into the port. An average person, average skipper of a ship can't just go, oh, I'll just sail in. You have to anchor off and wait for a pilot. So the first pilot boat tries to get out to her to bring her into Liverpool and fails because the wind's getting up too much. Right. A second pilot boat launches and again fails. But it's relatively all right. She's got two big, strong anchors and she's got an engine. She's got a really early engine. 
she should be fine. Mm -hmm. So the captain goes round behind this point Linus, sets the two anchors to wait out the storm. That night, the storm starts to come in and the wind changes direction. Rather than being protected by Point Linus, all of a sudden the wind is blowing him towards the shore. But two nice strong anchors out there holding it perfectly safe until the first anchor chain snaps. Oh. Now they've got a problem. Yes. <laughs> being held on one anchor and she's dragging backwards. It's not the anchor chain that breaks on the first, the second chain. It's actually the anchor doesn't hold well enough. She hits the rock stern first, destroying her propeller, putting her, her engine out of action. All of a sudden, she's at the mercy of quite literally a hurricane. We don't get many hurricanes in Britain. She managed to get hit by one. She comes slewing round and all of a sudden she's side onto the waves. If you ever visit where she is, it's a little tiny remote part of the Welsh coastline, lovely place. There is a shingle beach. Had she hit the shingle beach, she would have been washed up and the people would have been safe. There's a lovely sandy beach. Had she hit the sandy beach, they would have been even safer. But between these two is a little outcrop of rock, not much longer than the ship itself. And it was here that she struck. Just underneath is a layer of clay, or was a layer of clay, with the wreck now, the sand's all built up. And as she heeled in towards the shore with the force of the waves, she pressed herself into the clay and made a mould of herself, if you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. As she rolled out, the sea rushed into this mould. And then as she came back in, she forced the water back out again. So you're standing there on deck. You're an 1850s lady or a gentleman. You've got your clothes on. You're probably not a very good swimmer. Do you choose to jump when the ship has rolled in? And is the master literally touching the shore? Or do you choose to when the ship has rolled out? And it's a big ship, so there's a huge distance. So people were choosing to jump when the ship rolled in. As she rolled back out again, she sucked them underneath. And that was the mystery that first brought us as a company um, to look for this, to look at this vessel, because 250 people were never found. 450 people on board and 250 and about half the gold were never found again. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah, and that was what we found. We found that they'd been sucked underneath. And it was in the 18, oh, sorry, I apologize. It was in 1984, 85 that my dad was actually the person who took out some of the steel plates of the ship and underneath pressed in was a time capsule of Victorian life. So the ship happened there. Now, another thing that brought us back to the ship was on the 150th anniversary, a newspaper ran a story. And there was a little tiny mention in the story that the locals had killed the people as they'd come ashore. And they were saying that it was coincidence, it was too much, there was too many people missing. And none of the people who washed up on shore had any gold on them. So if everyone who's washed up on shore is missing their gold, the, the thought was that it must have been stolen by the local people. Yeah. Now, one of the things you find in little Welsh villages is 150 years is nothing. And the people living there are still the grandsons and granddaughters and great grandsons and great granddaughters of the people that are being accused of this crime. So we were asked to come in and say, was this true? Yeah. Was it true that people were clubbing these survivors to death and stealing all their gold from them? Exactly. Yes. Was it? So we went in to look at that and there was a couple of questions that we were meant to answer. Why were the people who washed up, why did they have no gold? And why about the time that the storm happened, did the village become much, much richer? Mm -hmm. So people are sure missing gold, people in the village suddenly have got money. You can see where the questions came about. Well, first things, as a scientist, I come across gold doesn't float. Yes. And if you were trying to swim to shore with a couple of bars of gold down your pants and a couple of big bags of gold in your petticoats as a woman, you're not going to make it to shore. Yeah. And that was the problem. The people who tried to take their gold with them were the ones that sank and were trapped under the wreck. The people who decided to abandon their gold and leave it on, sh on the boat were the ones who made it to shore, even though a lot of them did die. 40 people in total survived on the wreck. So if the gold was still on the wreck, why did all these people suddenly manage to get money? 
So what we found is the first thing we started to say is, well, what did the locals do at the time of the wreck? Right. And we found a story of absolute immense bravery. I mean, can you imagine you're a, a local farmer? In fact, it was a local sheep farmer who first noticed the wreck. The slates were blowing off his roof. His roof of his house was literally blowing away. And he got on the roof to see if he could stop the slates blowing away. And just across the other side of the field, he saw the mast of this ship and realised she was too close to shore. So he ran down and he got a load of people together. And a load of the men from the village ran down. And they could see two crewmen in the water. And the crewmen were trying to swim to shore with a rope to help the passengers ashore. They didn't have any ropes of their own, the men from the village. The only thing they had was their selves. And they linked arms and waded into the surf of a hurricane to actually grab hold of one of the men. And mm -hmm. um, we tend to know him as Joe Rodriguez. I can never pronounce his name. I think he was from Gibraltar. And he's got a lovely name, but I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. Locally, he was known as Joe Rogers. Um, a, a, an amazing man who went on later to rescue people from all sorts of scenarios. When you read through his life, it's like he was walking home from the pub and someone fell in the water and he was the one who jumped in and saved them. But he was the one that they managed to get to and pull ashore. And that rope actually was the thing that saved the 40 people. It wasn't until one of the female passengers was trying to come across that she panicked and she actually stopped anyone else coming after her. The ship then broke apart and everybody went into the water and sadly, the vast majority of them drowned. So that was the things we were called in. And we could prove that no gold came ashore because people can't swim when they're weighed down with gold. Where did the money come from the village? Well, in fact, people were donating because of this bravery. And people were coming into the village to look for the bodies of their sons and daughters and husbands. And they were staying in the local town and they were staying in local equivalents of B&Bs. And people were there. They were there spending money. Wow. That's incredible. What a story. <laughs> <laughs> and for, so then for the ones who died, where were they buried? So the ones that came ashore, um, they were buried in between the local churchyards. It's a very early case of forensic identification. It, it, it's harrowing for members of family to go and try and identify bodies. So a local vicar came up with a very simple system in that he wrote down as many of the details as he could about the people. And he went and said to people, you know, you're looking for your daughter. What color hair did she have? Um, was she tall? Was she short? And in that way, he managed to identify a lot of the bodies. There's quite a spooky tale. Um, a mother um, was, she'd received a letter from her son. And in the letter, it had come by another ship. He said, I think I'm coming on, and I, to be honest, I can't remember the name of the ship he was meant to be on. I think I'm coming on this ship. But I'm just writing to tell you, I've seen the Royal Charter and she is amazing. She's on the dock opposite and she'll be leaving soon. Two of my friends are aboard her and they will come back to England before I will. Could you please, you know, show them the sights and make sure they've got somewhere to stay and give them a nice home cooked Liverpool meal. So she hears of the um, wreckage and she says, oh, my son's friends. And she gets her husband's and their family and they take the cart and they go down. Now, in those days, women just sort of did as they were told. So her husband goes to find out, is there anything that he and the family can do to help? And she wanders up the beach, which is strewn with the wreckage. And she sees the top of a sea chest. Now, sailors lived out of their sea chest. They were sort of the suitcases of the day. Mm -hmm. And on the top, you'd write your name. So you knew whose was whose. And she'd written her son's name on his sea chest herself. And when she turned over the sea chest, this poor woman saw her own handwriting staring back at her with her own son's name. At the last minute, he'd managed to get a passage on the Royal Charter home. And sadly, he was one of the ones that died. Oh. That's too bad. Wow, what a story. That's incredible. <laughs> it is. It, it's one of those creepy stories. Almost 100 years to the day later, another ship wrecked herself almost in exactly the same spot. Luckily, everybody got off on that one, but it was like daring her of anything. The local lifeboat crew came alongside trying to take ships, uh, the ship's crew off this vessel. And a wave picked the lifeboat up and dropped it onto the deck of this sinking vessel. Instead of panicking, the helm of the lifeboat got everybody aboard. And when the next wave took his vessel off, managed to get clear of the wreck. Right. And there's a, a road named after him. And if you go down there, there's a big statue to him as well. Wow. 
lucky for that, exactly. And could you please be so kind to tell the views about the legend of Liz Hellug? Oh, that's my other, that's my other interesting area. That's good. So, as the legend goes, um, if you go along the Welsh coast, there's this place called the Great Orm. Now, the Great Orm's been used through history because inside this headland sticking out into the sea is copper. Lots and lots of copper. Now, cast your mind back to history. Copper's the main thing in bronze. So when we have the Bronze Age, that's where we start to get a lot of the copper. So we have Cornish tin and we have Welsh copper going together to make British bronze at the time. Now, around there was quite a rich area. The tribe who controlled the copper mine was getting in the equivalent of money at the time. They were quite well off. And a palace was built near this great orb, the Palace of Lays Helig. And as the legend goes, they became decadent and they were throwing wild parties and they weren't caring for the land. And one day they were having a massive party and all of a sudden someone cried out that the sea was rushing in. And all the royal family and all their guests ran up and they got to somewhere called Pemma which is a big, at the time it was a big cliff. And they stood there and watched as the sea covered the land. So it's a lovely story, but you start to say, well, it's a lovely story, you know, and equally we have lovely stories of dragons also roaming the Welsh hills. But what got me interested in this particular one is if you go out to the spot that's marked and is actually called the road immediately above it on the coastline is called Lays Helleg Road, so you can find it quite easily, there is actually something that looks like a building out there. And I'm not the first to think this by any means. In the 19th century, quite a few antiquitarians, sort of the early archaeologists, went out there and they rode out and they walked along these bricks and they said, it's a building. Since then, later archaeologists have said, no, it's just very, very neatly organised rocks. But it still raises a question mark. Right. Now, as part of my research looking for lost Roman ports, I look at coastal change. So it would be nice if all the ports were still on land where we'd expect a port to be. For me, a lot of the ports are two and three miles offshore now. So while I was doing my research into the ports of the area, I found that there was a lot of ambiguity about where the coastline was, which is quite difficult when you're researching something that involves a coastline and you go, well, where was the water? And everyone sort of goes, don't know. <laughs> we're not quite sure. It was out there somewhere. And I found that about the time of the legend of Lays Helig, we do know that the sea came massively in and encroached on the land. Right. We've got talk of there being roads out there. We've got talk of um, a little island that stuck mm -hmm. out there, people describing not as an island, but as a headland. We have a, a strait, so a channel between an, what's now an island, the Isle of Anglesey, and the mainland. Well, people say that that might have been a river. So it's a really ongoing one, Lays Helig. But what we can actually tell is about the time the legend says the sea rose or the land fell. We're not quite sure which way around it went. But we know that in later years, time when people were racing things down, a graveyard's actually been flooded. Um, and I do know a little bit up the coast, we've lost actually an entire Roman port and the Viking port and the early medieval town. So we know the sea's definitely encroached in this area. So what we're trying to say is, well, if the seas come in, and if there seems to be some sort of structure out there, is it possible that it's not neatly organised stones, that we are looking at maybe a Bronze Age or an Iron Age palace out there or some sort of structure? Is there any evidence that we can find this lost place? Yes, <laughs> there is. Um, I've still got the photos. I've um, got lots of nice photos of these actual stones. And the plan is over the next few summers, it, the problem with diving on the coast of Wales is winters can be really bad and really dangerous to dive in. So probably over the next few summers, once we've stopped looking for lost ports of uh, Roman period, we'll actually be going out there and trying to dive on this location. At very, very low tide, you can walk on it. I don't know what it's like and whether you live very near to the coast, but round here, our tides are about 10 metres, so just over 30 foot. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine the water coming up 30 foot, it also goes inland quite a way. Um, well, in Canada, we do. We yeah, you've also got some really big ones as well. I think there's a place in Canada that just beats us for having one of the largest tidal ranges. Right, yes, we do. We have yeah. beat you. <laughs> Definitely. So you can imagine that if we've got something that's dry land at sort of midday, you're suddenly sitting around going, oops, the water's coming in a bit faster. 
So with these sorts of things, we do have to take a lot of precautions and be careful and <laughs> try not to drown people, <laughs> yeah. even if they are. <laughs> And is less Halag like the Atlantis I played a world about, or do you think there are many sunken lands like Atlantis? I think there's a lot of them. The thing with the uh, Greek and Roman myths of Atlantis and all that sort of thing is they place it beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which is the Straits of Gibraltar, so they say it was sort of outside the Mediterranean. Now, with a lot of that sort of geography, it, they sort of say we have here and we have over there. And it's a big problem. Where, where was over there? How far away are we talking about? We know that um, in 543 AD, we have evidence that there was a lot of coastal change in this region. Mm -hmm. Now, some scholars place that as the same point as the Krakatoa, because Krakatoa is on the opposite side of the world to us. Mm -hmm. Was that the first time Krakatoa went off? Did it make some sort of seismic event that traveled all around the world or is it just coincidence that the two of them happened in the same year precisely the river mersey is one of the biggest rivers in britain and at one point was the biggest shipping river in the world mm -hmm. except the river doesn't act like a river should you do gcse geography gcse is what we do at sort of the end of school here mm -hmm. you do that at school and you learn that rivers get wider as they go to the sea the River Mersey doesn't do that, it gets a little bit wide and then it goes very, very narrow. Yes, exactly. And the channel runs out and then turns through 90 degrees and runs in another direction, or it did until they dredged a new channel out. There was a lot of evidence that maybe until relatively recently, I, I'm an archaeologist, to me I'm talking about 1600 years, relatively recently. Um, the River Mersey wasn't the same as it is now. It didn't actually open at the same point as it does. Now, if we have such a huge catastrophic thing that would create a new entrance to a river, then it's easy enough to see that you'd get landslips further along the coast or even the sea rising up and breaking through a barrier, creating new river entrances and drowning these landscapes. That's amazing. And what does the name Lise Hellig mean for the audience I may not know? Um, I think it was to do with the prince who owned it at the time. I'll have to pass on that one. <laughs> Don't worry. Well, anyway, can we just go into the Roman ports that you're searching for? Can we just go into a little bit more of a topic for the audience? Like, yeah. What inspired you to get into that search? So, what inspired you in that one? I'm out one day and I'm standing at the end of the Wirral. Now, the Wirral sits between two rivers. It's a beach, it's nice and open, and but it's nothing more than hard packed sand now. And I got talking to someone, um, an older gentleman who knew some of the history of the area. And he was telling me that that beach had once upon a time been the biggest port in the country. Wow. And he's standing there. It's a beach. It's a big beach, but it's nevertheless, there's nothing there. And I said to him, but it, it's one of the stormiest places. You can't anchor here because your boat will be driven ashore. And he said, yes. But a thousand years ago, all those sandbanks out there were dry land. And you could come in here and shelter behind that nice dry land. And then you could move either up the River Dee to a place, a Roman place called Chester. Um, it's a lovely place if you can ever go to it. You can actually wander around and see Roman amphitheaters and Roman walls. Or you can go the other way and up the river uh, up the river Mersey to Liverpool, to a place called Warrington, um, and further on to Manchester. Now, Liverpool and Manchester are two of the big cities around here. Manchester, anything ends in Chester, comes from having a Roman fort. I see. So we have Roxeter, Manchester, Chester, all those sorts of things, uh, Ribchester. It just means, so Ribchester is the Roman force on the river Ribble. Um, Chester is the chief one we tend to think about. And he was telling me all these things, and I'm a scientific archaeologist, and I'm sitting there going, mm, of course they did, yes, yes, yes. Of course there's a church out there that we've never heard of. Of course there's this huge Roman force. Totally sceptical. So I go home, but there was a few things he said which just had that ring of truth to them. So I went home and I did a bit of research into it. 
And I found out that there was a heck of a lot of interest in that and a hell of a lot of research telling us what was there. So I went back and I started to have a look and I found that thousands and thousands of artifacts were found in the Roman period. Wow. This suddenly has gone from maybe there was a Roman ship or two to, oh, there was a lot of artifacts here. Now give me a question, I need an answer. And this threw up lots of questions. We've got thousands of artifacts. Why? Why were they here? Oh. If they were here for a port, well, where was the stuff going? Why were the people coming to here on the port? Just 30 miles away, maybe a little bit less, is the port of Chester. Why weren't they just sailing up the River Dee and going there? Then I found out that there was roads, Roman roads, that ran towards this port and then just disappeared into the sea. I found out that during excavations to dig a canal across this, they found a full graveyard of people near where the sea was actually washing over the graveyard. Wow. I found that uh, fishermen were frequently catching their nets on somewhere they called the church or the churchyard. A friend of mine rang me one day shortly after and said, I've just run aground. To which my response was, and what do you want me to do about it? I'm in Warrington, you're in Mel's, deal with it yourself. And she went, no, 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 I'm not calling to tell you I'm running aground, I can cope with that. She said, I've called to tell you I've run aground in a boat, two miles offshore, and I'm standing on a building. Right. And from that, that just caught my attention. To the point I decided to do my thesis on looking for these missing ports um, and what they can tell us about about the cities that we grow, grow up in. That is incredible and what a nice topic you chose. Now can you please be so kind to tell us where the greatest battle in English history was taking place? In? Oh, I presume you're talking about Burrinburra there. Yes, please tell us about Yes, that's, that's another one. Probably the greatest battle that we don't actually know about. Sorry, one of my lights has just turned itself off. There you go. <laughs> right, probably the greatest battle we don't actually know anything about, or people don't tend to know about it. So, go back into history teacher mode a little bit. The Romans arrived, and the Romans took England and Wales, or most of Wales. We have what we call a highland and a lowland zone. So if you imagine England as sort of a triangle, and you take the tip of the triangle, take off Scotland, and then draw a diagonal, so you leave the northwest of England and Wales and Cornwall off on one side, and then the southeast, London, and part of the northeast on the other side. And the Romans really did occupy this lowland zone, London and all that sort of area. But in Wales and the northwest, we get these constant things where they're saying, we've defeated the Welsh, and then a year later, we defeated the Welsh again, and then a year after that, we defeated them again. Trust me, if you're having to defeat them every year, you have not defeated them in the first place. Mm -hmm. So we come to the mid 400s and the Romans leave. The empire's collapsing and they take all the troops and they go and try and save the empire. And all of a sudden Britain's left in a vacuum. And then we enter what is called, or shouldn't be called anymore, the Dark Ages. It's the period that we didn't really know much about. We know a lot now. And then we get into the period where we start to see the Angles and the Saxons arriving. The Angles, the Saxons and the Jutes. And they were actually invited in to help against the Irish sea pirates that were raiding the shore. So these people arrive and they're invited in and it's a bit of a daft one. If you've got no way of protecting yourself, it's not a great idea to invite an army to come and stay with you. Exactly. So next thing you know, we have the Angles and the Saxons, the Anglo-Saxons, and they take over and they eventually start to call the place, it becomes Angleland, so England. They drive the original British out and they drive them um, to Wales. So when people say the original British, or people say things like, oh, I, I'm British and my family have always been British and my brain goes, so you're Welsh or Irish? Because the original British were chased out by these invaders. I see. Then in about 900, a new group turn up, the Vikings. I see. And they come from one side and the other side of England, up north. And they come across and they meet in the middle and they control the entire north of England. So now we have a divided nation. We've got, the Scotland, we've got Scotland up top that's mostly staying out of it. Not always staying out of it, but staying out of it a lot. 
we've got the Vikings controlling the north of England, and then in the south we have the Angles and the Anglo-Saxons who are controlling that. And then off to the west we've got the Welsh sort of sitting there going, "Oh, who's winning? Okay, yeah, we'll stay out of it for now." However, the Anglo-Saxons were starting to take over England, and they were getting more and more land. At one point, it seems they've got control. And in 937, mm -hmm. the Welsh, the Scots, some of the Irish, the Vikings of York and a few other groups decide that they're going to drive back the Anglo-Saxons and they're going to reclaim their lands. And they come together in this battle. And we only know of it via one poem. One great poem that's repeated so often it, it, it appears in six or seven different sources. And it talks about the great battle of Brunanburh where thousands died and I think it was something like 16 princes died and breathed their last and it was where the Anglo-Saxons drove the Vikings out of what we now know as England. He drove the Scots back up beyond their walls, he drove the Irish Vikings out back to Ireland, he drove the other Vikings out and they either went and stayed on the continent or took refuge in Scotland. At this point, the Viking leader, I think he was marrying one of the daughters of one of the Scottish princes or Scottish kings. So they had quite close collaboration. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time that someone stood there and said, I'm king of this entire land and we are all working together. Sadly, we don't know where it is. We don't really know who was there. We, we've got some good guesses and the poem tells us the main players. And according to the poem, the English won. But I wouldn't be surprised if we find a Viking poem saying that they won a bit. But we do know that after that, this whole area that we now refer to as England is governed under one leadership. We end up getting Viking leaders come back in. The great King Canute, um, he was the one who sat there and ordered the sea to retreat. And when it wouldn't, Saucer said to his courtiers, see, I don't know everything. I can't do everything. Um, so yeah, it was that sort of thing, but we're looking for a battle. Now, one thing we know is there should be a lot of bodies. It's one of the obvious things. Thousands of people die, they leave something behind. If we can find the battle site, we should have broken swords, jewelry, trappings, all this sort of thing. We just can't find it. Now, you were saying before, do all scholars agree on everything? This is one area where I don't think anybody agrees. Uh, we've got one person saying that it's on the east coast of Britain in a, a, a fort that would be referred to as the Brown Fort. We've got another group of people saying it's on the Wirral as a place called Bromborough. They're pulling the name Burrumburra and Bromborough, putting the two together. We've got other people saying it's in the middle of the country because there's been uh, coin hoards of about the right time found. And that's the thing when you're researching a lot of these things. Like I say, the answer I have today might not be the answer I believe tomorrow. With this particular battle, I've got no answer at all. Wow. And that's why you can only speculate about that, right? <laughs> totally. It's total speculation. But it's interesting. It's, it's one of the battles that made people stand here and say, I'm proud of England. Yeah. Well, this battle made England what the shape it is today. See, it's, it's history. And it was... Hadrian's water wheel line at the edge of the Roman Empire? Yes and no. Okay. And this. I think if you lived this side of Hadrian's Wall, you would have been taxed by the Roman Empire. And if you lived the other side of Hadrian's Wall, you would have got away without paying tax. <laughs> However, did the Romans venture beyond Hadrian's Wall? Yes. We've got forts up there. We've got villas. We've got full ports. Um, in Scotland, right up near the, the tip of Scotland, is a port called Aberdeen. It's really, really known now for oil. Um, if you get oil in, in, into England, or sorry, oil comes into Britain, it comes in via Aberdeen. But we find a lot of Roman artefacts around there. And we do know that the great Tacitus wrote that his father-in-law, who at the time was governor of England, um, or governor of Britain at the time for the Romans, he actually sent all his ships up there. But then that adds other questions. When we say the Roman Empire, do we mean where the Romans went? Did the Romans manage to make it across to the other side of the Atlantic and a bit closer to you guys? Or did they consider, you know, Ireland the end of the world and didn't venture past that point? 
Yeah, and that's the question I would like to ask you. How do you think they were able to reach different lands beyond large water bodies for any of them? For instance, do you believe that these cultures were able to reach North America? We know that um, some things were going across. So to take an example, we've got slightly better evidence for um, Prince Madoc of Wales. Um, <laughs> Owen Gwynedd's son. Owen Gwynedd was a king, and when he died, he left 19 sons, who all then decided to pretty much go to war with each other, except Madoc. Madoc decided to actually leave and look for new lands. Now, Madoc sailed across the ocean, and then he came back again with stories of this land far, far away. Now, according to some of my friends who live in the US, there is um, a bit in maybe the history of Alabama that says that maybe people did actually reach there. I think off the top of my head it was about the 1100s and there were actually tribes of people who claimed to have some sort of descendancy from this side of the Atlantic. We know that the Vikings were going over in that period of time and at least making it to Canada so it's not that big a stretch that they were sailing further down the coast. The thing people tend to forget is we say the Atlantic Ocean, it's huge, it's wide. Um, I've sailed across it 16 times so I know it quite well. But the thing with the Atlantic Ocean is if you come a bit further north, you can go from Ireland to Iceland to Greenland and then across to Canada. Yes, these are ocean voyages, but they're not these huge leaps of about 30 days it would take if you went further south and came across the Atlantic. Once you've reached a coastline, it's in a sailor's nature to just, oh, I'll just see what's down here and carry on going. Yes, and that, that's so true. You have such a point. Now, are the Welsh dragons memories of the Roman legions? So that's one of my new projects I'm looking at. The Welsh dragons, it seems like a really, it, it's an integral part of Wales, but where did we get this idea from? Where did we suddenly decide that dragons lived there? Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's a bit of a random one almost. I mean, the yeah. unicorn is the native animal of Scotland. I've not figured that one out. I will one day. <laughs> But the thing with the Dragons of Wales, it really interested me. And I, as a child, um, my grandparents lived in Wales, so I heard a lot of the legends. And my grandmother and grandfather lived in a little village called Dolgarog, which is right up in the middle of the Conway Valley. It's, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's lovely. But they have this legend of um, this dragon, a Garog. And Garog was meant to have come and he was meant to have raided and a brave man was meant to have stabbed him. And he flew over the valley and he died on the far side. And there's this big mound of earth that's meant to be where he died and where he's buried. And his bones are still under there. Which is fantastic when you're about three and you're hearing of these dragons. And then as you get older and you're an archaeologist, you're sitting there looking across the valley at this lump of earth going, Hold on, that's not just a lump of earth. There's something underneath that. So having a look at them, and I started to then look at these legends, and I found that a lot of the places where dragons were meant to have been buried, there were actually battles of the Romans, or at least battles of tribes that knew Roman techniques. We've got to remember when the Romans left, they didn't take all their ideas with them. And this mound of earth is presumably actually left with remnants of some sort of tribe. Maybe they built some sort of monument, Maybe it was underneath there is the bones after a battle. But that doesn't really tell us where the dragons were. I mean, where I'm standing right now, if I go two miles up the road, there's a little park. And the park is meant to be where one of these dragons fell, a very similar story. Just down by the river is a place called Penketh, which may or may not have been a Roman port. Legend has that that a man was in the marshes, the Curdly Marshes, one night and the great dragon came as it did every night to feast on the sheep and take people. And he rose up against this, this dragon and he stabbed it through the heart. And it flew for many, many miles with people chasing it. And it fell into this little park, which, like I say, is about two miles up the road from me, where it died. And Griffin Park, which is the park, is still there to memorialize this legend. And you say, well, it's a bit of a weird story. Great for kids. But then you have to remember that we are a nation where we tell stories for a reason. So you start to ask yourself, well, is the dragon coming in some sort of invading force? Is the dragon something that someone has to attack? 
is this story of it being mortally wounded and then chased for miles some sort of battle where the troops were retreating and people were chasing after them? Are these lumps and locations where we remember these stories, is that the final place of the battle where defeat was for whoever the troops? And then a colleague of mine pointed out that some of his research was going on. When the Romans rode into battle, they had a horn and it's shaped somewhat like we'd recognise as a dragon's head. And as the horse would gallop, the wind would blow through the horn and it would make this moaning noise. Um, this gentleman does reenactments and he said it's a really chilling noise to hear. But that head shape with the cavalry spread out behind them is the shape that we see in very early drawings when we're talking about dragons of Wales. And you start to suddenly see that this, the word dragon, if you, if you say the word legion, Instead, the legion came ashore at the port. Um, Dolgarog is also a port that could have been utilised by the Romans or very near to one. The legion came aboard, ashore at that point. The men turned round and the brave men stood up and fought them. The legion were forced into retreat and were killed on this hillside. Is that the story that's being passed down? And these bright colours and all this sort of thing is what we remember. And do you believe, I just have a quick question for you, do you believe that the ancients were technologically advanced? In fact, I can prove that in some ways the ancients were technologically advanced. Mm -hmm. One thing we've got to do is we can't ascribe things to them that we don't have ourselves. And I'm not saying that they had electricity or anything like that. Exactly. One of my big problems is I'm talking about the Romans and I'll say, oh, the Roman canals. And people look at me and go, Romans didn't build canals. And I'll say, well, Yes, they did. Yes. Huge ones. And I'll say, oh, Roman concrete. Romans didn't have concrete. Yes, they did. So a lot of the things that we see as being very modern, so concrete buildings, canals, divers, um, dredging with vessels, plumbing, pipes, all these things that we tend to see as being very modern were in fact brought in by the Romans. So the technology they had pretty much stops at electricity. Most of the things until we got to electricity, the Romans had, and half the time was far better than what we have. So did they have a lot of technology? Yes, they had a lot of technology. Did these ideas get round the Roman Empire? Well, yes, ships were traveling from India, up the Red Sea, via Egypt, they were coming into the Mediterranean, and then they were these people were passing on not just goods, but they were passing on ideas. They were saying, oh, did you see what so-and-so did? It was a brilliant idea. And someone else was thinking, oh, that could work with what I'm doing. These same people were leaving Rome and going through France, um, as it would be called Gaul then, coming over to Britain, and they were passing their ideas on. So we tend to think that people of ancient technologies were in very, very isolated areas and they weren't sharing ideas and they didn't have a lot of the things that we do. They did. What they don't always have and what I don't particularly like to do is I don't enjoy it when people say, oh, there was this great idea. So one thing I'm constantly arguing against is people say the Aztecs and the Egyptians both had pyramids. They were clearly communicating. And I'm saying, yes, but there was like 3000 years between the Aztecs and the Egyptians. So you're telling me someone went from Egypt with some vague memory of a 3000 year old technology, sailed across to South America and gave the Aztecs this technology, um, but they forgot to mention things like running water, they forgot to take other building techniques because at that period for a lot of the pyramids we're talking about, we've already got advanced building techniques over here in Europe. So. There is a lot of evidence that, yes, there was some great technology, and it's sometimes mind-blowing to stand in these places. Um, Stonehenge, if you stand in the middle of Stonehenge, it echoes in just a particular way that you can hear outside, and it's rather creepy in some ways. Um, some of the really old Roman sites that you're walking around, I'm going to Roman docks that are 2,000 years old almost, and I could sail a vessel in there today and carry on using it. Wow, what an adventure. And did the ancient Britons practice human sacrifice? Yes, short answer. 
Um, we know, if you've heard of Stonehenge, but you might not have heard of one called Durrington Walls, which is part of the same complex. So when we start building these great tombs, the thing we're starting to come into as a culture is this case of my land and your land. Now, imagine you are a hunter-gatherer. You might spend your life moving around. Everything you own, everything you want to keep safe, you carry with you, and that includes your children. So you will pick your children up, you will put them on your hip, and you will carry them and all your artifacts. You might have camps that you regularly stay at, but they're not necessarily somewhere you defend. If another tribe came in and was more forceful than you, you'd probably just move on to somewhere else. The second you put a crop in the ground, that's your land. You invested in that. If you don't stay around till that crop grows, you're not going to survive. So we've got these ideas of territories and we start to build these monuments. And in some ways, these monuments are people saying, look, this is my land. This is my culture, my beliefs. So Stonehenge is one of a whole complex. We tend to divide that area into the land of the living and the land of the dead. But Durrington Walls, it's huge. Um, sometimes you're standing in the middle of it and it's so big, you can't actually see the slope of the ground moving away from you. Right next to that is a replica of Stonehenge, but it would have been made out of wood. And in the middle is a stone, possibly you might describe it as an altar. And under that altar is the bones of a child. And you say, well, maybe they died and this henge was built to commemorate them. Except there's a very specific wound on the back of the head. And the only way for that wound to have been done was the child was kneeling with their head down when they were hit. So looking at that, yes. Did they practice this in huge numbers? No. Um, we get a lot of stories via through Roman writers. Now, Rome's in a lot of turmoil, and Julius Caesar's doing this thing where he keeps invading places, and they keep saying to him, stop invading places. We, we can't spend the money on you invading. So he needed an excuse to invade this nation. This one beyond the edge of the earth, they thought. They thought once you reached the edge of France or Gaul at the time, that there was nothing beyond there. And they were almost scared to cross that sea. Beyond that, we were pretty well defended at the time. We had big navies ourselves. We had a lot of things. So it wasn't an easy job for him to do. So he had to justify it. And one thing he used to justify it was that the British were barbarians. They were terrible people that needed the civilization of Rome. And some of the stories that he brought back reflected that, so that the Druids were piling people into wicker men and burning them and things like that. It's unlikely. We do know that when the Druids fled into Wales and they were pursued by the Roman army, and then they ended up on something called the Isle of Anglesey uh, with the sacred groves and things like that, the local people came out and supported them. The tribes came out to defend them. You're not likely to be going out and defending people if they're killing hundreds of people every year. But were they doing specific rituals and doing sacrifice in them? Yes, we've got some good evidence for a select number. Wow, that sounds incredible. And what are some topics that you would like to research in the near future? So lots of different things. I'm one of these people when, like I say, when I see a, a question, I have to find the answer. Um, so one thing I'm going to look at is what were the Romans doing in Scotland? Where are they going up there? Yes, it's Lake Helig. It's one of the ones I'm actually going to go back to. We also have other legends all the way around the coast saying things that people were going into. And one a little bit closer to home is actually a very modern one normally for me. I normally play with things thousands of years ago. Not that long ago in archaeological history, we got the first ever passenger railway line running along here, and the famous um, rail, uh, the famous train, the Rocket. You might have heard of that one. Mm -hmm. So that ran. In fact, I can almost hear the trains out of my bedroom window that run along that line now. On the day it opened, it was big fanfare. And the Duke of Wellington, who was a famed soldier and was prime minister at the time, came down to be one of the first passengers. And the local MP, William Huskinson, was also there. And he and the Duke hadn't got on. William Huskinson had, had insulted him at some point. So halfway through the journey, they paused to take on more water and to get out and admire these new technology of trains. And there was, there was three of them, if I remember rightly. 
William Huskinson got up until a great cry went out that on the other line the rocket was coming down. And he panicked and tried to jump into the Duke's carriage. Now, he didn't make it. He fell back and was actually killed by the rocket, the first ever passenger train. Was he, did he fall? Was it just his age and his infirmity and he fell? Or was there something slightly more sinister going on with that? Yes. So, yes. That's one of the projects I'm looking at now. Um, another one is, have you ever heard of the Pendle Witches? No, but can you please tell us about that? So, obviously, you'll have heard of witchcraft all over yes. and the burning of the witches. We have a, quite a famous case where an old woman was found out in the forest and, and a tinker asked her for something because she didn't give it him or there was some conversation that went on and then what happened is shortly after the tinker died he had a row with her and he died mm -hmm. she was accused of witchcraft her and seven other women were rounded up and they were taken to Lancaster um, which is uh, now is still it's only just recently closed as being a prison it's a big castle on a hill it used to be a Roman port as well and they were hung for witchcraft and they died. Pendle, the area, is still an area steeped in these legends and, and myths and things like that. But what was the story behind those women? Right. Why were they living out there on their own? Mm -hmm. There's a whole family living out there. We're starting to see traces of archaeology. They're really one of the big first cases. About the same time, we have stories of... Um, royal shipwrecks going down and they're saying well were they cursed by this so the pendle witches is probably one of the ones that's on my to-do list for research in the near future uh, i'm very excited for you and could you please be so kind to tell the viewers where people can find you so i'm just starting a new website to all of this so it should be up and running soon and that's www.mythsmysteryandmurder.com mm -hmm. can you say it again for body myths mysteryandmurder.com Okay, then please go over there and then you can find out more about her in the near future. So thank you for coming on to the Natalie Marie Hart Show. It is always an honor and a pleasure to interview you and I hope to interview you in the near future. That would be great. Thank you for listening to the Natalie Marie Hart Show. I would like to thank everyone for listening. You can check out my website www.crystalkidsradio.com for more. You can also like my Facebook page Natalie Marie Hart or follow me on my Google+. Love, peace, and harmony. Love you all.